We've come now to the ninth chapter of 2 Corinthians in our journey through the Bible. And we'll be studying this ninth chapter tonight. This morning we'd like to draw your attention to the last verse, verse 15, where Paul declares, Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Now in the 8th and the ninth chapter, Paul has been talking to the Corinthians about his desire for them to give, to help out the poor church in Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem has gone through a lot of pressure, a lot of persecution, a lot of stress, and as the result, it is going through tremendous financial difficulty. Paul is not asking for an offering for himself. In fact, he sort of boasts in the fact that he never took anything from them. That while he was with them, he received help from the churches of Macedonia, and he was laboring with his own hands so that he wouldn't be chargeable to any of them. And where he would not ask for something for himself, he was brave or emboldened to ask them to give generously for the needs of the church in Jerusalem. He'll be coming by soon to visit them in order to take the offerings to the church in Jerusalem that they have hopefully generously given. And so... As Paul is talking to them about their giving to God, he tells them that the real incentive for giving is God's glorious gift to us. Thanks be unto God for his indescribable gift. In the eighth chapter, Paul said, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. The riches, the blessings that you have experienced is because of God's rich blessings upon you through Jesus Christ. The Bible emphasizes over and over that God is the initiator and that man is the responder. John tells us that we love him because he first loved us. The love did not initiate with man. We did not have this intense love for God and commitment to God so that God said, oh, look at that, isn't that sweet? Look how much they love me. I think I will love them. No, God was the initiator in this loving relationship that we have. It was God who so loved us uh, that he gave his only begotten son. And so I am to respond to that love of God. And so with our giving, our giving isn't in order that we might receive from God. Uh, God was the initiator. It was God who first gave to us. And because of what God has given to us, then our hearts cry out, what can I give to God? Uh, he has given me through love so much. I love him. What can I give to show him my love for him? Uh, this is the dilemma sort of that David had in Psalm 116 where David said, what shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits unto me? What can you give to someone who has everything? What can you give to God that he really needs? And of course the answer is nothing. God doesn't need a thing from us. So what can I give? I want to give something. I love God. I want to respond to his love for me. God has given me 
these indescribable gifts and I want to show God I love him and return, but what can I give to God? And so man is the responder. God is always the one who has initiated the relationship with us. He's the one who initiated the love, the giving. So Paul said, as he's talking to the Corinthians about their giving to God, he sort of ends the whole section of this part on their giving by saying, oh, thanks be unto God for his indescribable gift. Now, Paul doesn't tell us what he is referring to when he talks about his indescribable gift. And that's all a Bible commentator needs uh, is just a little silence uh, where you can begin to wax eloquent. And thus, as you read the commentaries, you'll find that uh, the uh, men who have made a commentary on this passage of Scripture uh, conclude many different things when he talks about God's indescribable gift. What is he talking about? And uh, so there are many different ideas, but let's just say it doesn't really matter. We can just take a look at the gifts that God has bestowed and and you can choose any of them that you like. And whatever you like best, say, well, that's the gift, you know. The gift of his son. What an indescribable gift that is. That God should love us so much that he would give his only begotten son for us. Oh, thanks be unto God for the indescribable gift of his son. John said, here in his love, not that we love God, that's really no big deal, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He sent his son to take our sins. God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. He sent his son to take the penalty of our sin. To die in our place. What an indescribable gift. God giving his only begotten son to die for our sins. Prophet Isaiah said, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. God gave his son for you. Paul goes on to say, For if God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how much more then shall he not freely give us all things? In other words, God has demonstrated his willingness to give to you by giving the most valuable, glorious, indescribable gift possible, and that is his only begotten son. Anything else that we might ever need is totally insignificant in comparison with what God has already demonstrated his willingness to give to you. So that is why Jesus said, ask that you might receive, that your joy might be full. He told you how that the Father delights to give good gifts to his children and encourages you to ask and not be afraid to ask. Because God has already demonstrated there's nothing of value that he will withhold from you because he loves you so much. But then 
there is this wonderful gift of salvation. By grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, Paul said, it is a gift of God. Think of this glorious gift of salvation, indescribable gift, that God should redeem me from my sin, that God should save me from the power of sin that was ruling as a tyrant over my life that God should save me from the penalty of my sin, the judgment of God that is to be meted out against sinners, but I've been saved from the judgment of God. In the book of Hebrews, the question is asked, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? The answer is there really is no escape. No escape from the judgment of God if you neglect the salvation that God has offered to us as a gift through his son Jesus Christ. But then there is also that gift of eternal life. And this is the record that God has given unto us eternal life and that life is in the son and he that has the son has life Jesus said as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life the gift of eternal life. It's interesting how that there is sort of a unspoken awareness or consciousness that death is so often a great interrupter. When a person comes to the place in life where they have hit the peak of their talent, they have stored up so much knowledge in the particular trade. They know and they understand and they know all of the tricks, all of the shortcuts, all of the things that you do. That so often a person is taken at that point when they have the greatest skills and ability. I love to watch a person who is a true professional in their trade. I love to watch them work. Uh, Kay and I had a uh, table that we loved. We bought it many years ago. We loved the style. Uh, it was a sturdy table, well made. But it had faded in the sun. Uh, the water had sort of messed up the middle of the table where she often put pots of flowers. And so the paint was peeling. And, and still we love the, the design. And, and after these, this many years, we still just sort of love the shape and the design of the table. And it fits so perfectly in our breakfast room. So I met a man, a, a Swedish man from the old country, and he said that he was a furniture refinisher. And so I told him about this table that we had and wondered if he could do something for it. He said, oh, sure, you know. And so uh, <laughs> he came over and in the morning started working on that table, stripped all of the old paint off, sanded it, and I watched I would go out through every process just to watch and put several different colors of stain and so forth. And by the day's end, that table looked better than new. I mean, that fellow was so skilled. 
And he knew all of the trades. He knew exact, I mean, all about the trade. He knew exactly what colors to put on. He knew exactly the finishes and, and so forth. And it was just a pleasure to watch him work. And, and, and so it is when a person has developed all of the skills and all, then you get old and you pass on. And, and you think, my, you know, life isn't, haven't accomplished all that I could yet, you know. And death seems to be an interrupter. I think of, of Warren and his tremendous ability in, in repairing cars. I don't know what we're going to do around here. Uh, I mean, this guy was one of those expert body men and painters, and he knew how to pull out dents, drill little holes, and I've been out there, worked with him at a time or two, and just marvel at his skill and ability to take a total wreck and make something beautiful out of it. And um, he has been keeping all of our vans and all of the equipment around here painted and fixed up and looking great. And, uh, but the skills that he has, and, and now for the Lord to take him, we wonder, what are we going to do? You know, if, if someone smashes a fender now on one of the school buses, what are we going to do? I mean, uh, the, the cost that you have to pay anymore to get you know, body work done and all, uh, they just charge you almost to look at it and uh, to tell you how much it's going to cost you to get it fixed, you know. And uh, it's astronomical what uh, they charge. And so, but yet here he is at the peak of his skill and gone. So we get that sense of life needs to be extended somehow. And of course, we have this glorious gift of eternal life. And, and it sure takes the pain, a great portion of the pain of separation, to realize that those who have gone on have entered into the eternal glory, the gift of eternal life that is ours through Jesus Christ. Whether or not Paul was talking about the gift of salvation or the gift of Jesus Christ or the gift of eternal life, we're not sure. But any of them and all of them really provoke a response of thanksgiving in our hearts. If we think about Jesus Christ coming to take my sin, dying in my place, it, it provokes in my heart a response of thanksgiving. If I think about salvation, the fact that my sins are forgiven, it provokes a response of, salva of, of thanksgiving. And if I think of eternal life, I'm going to be with the Lord forever, it, it just provokes a response of praise and thanksgiving in my heart. These gifts, all of them, defy description. And any thanks that we do give to God is so inadequate. It seems so inadequate to just say, oh, thank you, Father. That doesn't express the fullness of my feelings of gratitude and praise. There are no words that can express how much we love him and appreciate him for the gifts that he has given to us. Now, David was an extremely articulate person. In fact, the Psalms rank among some of the most glorious literature in the world. David had a way with words. And yet, when God revealed his great mercy and grace to David, David became speechless. David was talking with his friend, the prophet Nathan, and he said, you know, I've been thinking, I live in this lovely palace, and look, people are going over to that tent to worship God. God's dwelling in a tent. That's not right. We ought to build the most beautiful building in the world for the Lord. 
rather than having to go to a tent to meet with him, we ought to meet in a fabulous building. Beautiful, glorious. Nathan said, David, that sounds great. Do it. That night, the Lord came to Nathan and said, Nathan, you were wrong in encouraging David to build a house for me. David's hands are bloody. He has shed a lot of blood. He's a man of war. It wouldn't be in keeping for David to build me a house. And so you're going to have to go back and tell David that he can't build the house for me. But tell David that I took him out of that sheep coat from following after the sheep and I made him the ruler over my people. And I have delivered his enemies into his hands. I've prospered and blessed his kingdom. And his seed shall build the house for me and shall dwell upon the throne forever. And so when Nathan came with that news, David recognized that God was promising to him, though he was unworthy to build the house for God, God was going to build David's house. That is, he understood that to mean that the Messiah would actually come from David's seed. And to think that the Messiah would come through him was just overwhelming to David. And he went before the Lord and he said, Lord, what can I say? What can you say? When you realize the wonderful gifts of God, these indescribable gifts, what can you say? And David, the man of words, was just sort of silent and just let his heart speak. God, he said, you know me. You know what's in my heart. You know what I'm feeling, Lord. You just read what you see in my heart and what you know is in my heart because I can't express it. It's indescribable. And so are the gifts of God. They're indescribable. They are so glorious And so Paul is talking to them about giving. But oh, thanks be unto God for his indescribable gift. So uh, Paul is encouraging them to respond to God. Not to think that they are initiating. I do not love God in hopes of persuading him to love me. I love him because he first loved me. My love is responsive. I do not praise God in hopes of receiving something from God. Though I grew up in that kind of a background where they would often say, now God blesses those who praise him, so let's all lift our hands and praise the Lord tonight that we might receive a blessings, the blessings of God and so forth. And and I came to realize that Uh, That isn't true praise. If I'm only saying nice things to him uh, in order that I can get something from him, he can surely see through that. We used to have a kid up the street. His name was Jim, and he ran with our oldest son, Chuck. And uh, when Jim wanted Chuck to be able to go with him and do certain things, uh, he would say, I'll I'll talk to your dad, Chuck. And he'd come up and he'd say, Mr. Smith. You've got the most attractive shirt. Where did you get that shirt, you know? Start on this kind of stuff. And it got to the place where when he'd come up and say, Mr. Smith, you surely have raised some great sons and all. I'd say, okay, Jim, what do you want? You know, I mean, uh, you know that it was just trying to butter you up in order to get something. And, and, And if I praise God because I'm, thinking, oh, I want to get some special blessing from God, so I'll, you know, just praise him. God can see through that. The truest praise, the truest praise 
is that which rises spontaneously from my heart when I realize how good God has been to me and how totally undeserving I am. And you just say, oh God, you're far out. I can't believe this. I, after my miserable failure and look what you've done. Lord, you're too much, you know. And that's the truest form of praise. It's just spontaneous. It isn't, oh, well, let's, you know, let's butter him up. Let's tell him, no, oh, I love you so much, and you're so great and wonderful. Now, Lord, will you, you know. <laughs> the true motive for giving is just to realize how generous God has been his indescribable gifts to us. And when you think about that, I, I want to express my love for him. I want to show him how much I appreciate. And, and so I respond in giving because of these glorious gifts that God has given to me. Now, we often hear teaching that would sort of intimate that man is the initiator and that God is the responder. That we will, if we praise him, God will respond. If we pray, God will respond. And, and we, we look at man as the initiator and God as the responder. Now, it is true that if we give to God, there is a principle of giving that God has established and it is true that if we give to God, God will give back to us. Jesus said, give and it shall be given unto you. Measured out, pressed down, running over, shall men give into your bosom. And, and so the Bible speaks of, of this principle of giving. And if you give to God, God is going to return to you again. Uh, and, and so... There are many people that are motivated to give to God on the basis of, well, he, he's going to give me tenfold back, or he's going to give me thirtyfold back, or fiftyfold back. But that's, that's not the motive for giving to God, uh, of, you know, well, he pays good interest. <laughs> the real motive is, oh, everything I have, God has given to me. He has given so much. I want to give back to God to show him my appreciation, to express my appreciation for his indescribable gifts to me. We have a church up in Twin Falls, Idaho, that is a Calvary Chapel up there. And uh, they have recently purchased some property uh, to build a new sanctuary. And um, so the property is just outside of the city limits and they don't have a city water that comes to the property. But there's one of those good old boys there in Twin Falls who owns a drilling company. And he's the kind that, uh, you know, every once in a while you ought to do something good, you know. And uh, he doesn't go to church or isn't really a godly man, but, you know, there are those people that uh, just, uh, you know, you should once in a while do something good for uh, the church or for God. And so he volunteered to uh, dig a well for the church, free of charge. Just, I'll bring my rig out and I'll dig you a well out there, you know. And so he brought his rig out, and while he was digging the well, he won the lottery. Now he wants to know if there's anything more he can do for the church. <laughs> and and it, there is a truth, a principle of giving that the Bible has established. Uh, and, but that shouldn't be your motive for giving. Paul speaks about it here. If we give sparingly, we will reap sparingly. If we give bountifully, we will reap 
bountifully. Uh, so uh, we understand sowing and reaping principles, and, and the Bible teaches that that is a principle of giving. If you give to God sparingly, you'll receive sparingly. If you give bountifully, you'll receive bountifully. And it's just, it's just a principle. But that should not be our motive. Nor should the motive be to be seen of men, to make a big show of it, uh, to be ostentatious. And Paul points out in the chapter that our giving really shouldn't be out of pressure or out of constraint. Because someone is pushing and trying to put their burden over onto us and uh, their ministry is going to fail or collapse if we don't uh, you know, send in the support this week and it's urgent and it's an emergency and, and all that. that. That should not ever be our motive for giving because someone has pressured us to give. But the real motive for giving is God's indescribable gift to us. Oh Lord, you're so good. You've given me so much. I want to give to you, Lord, just as a sign of my appreciation and my love for your indescribable gift. And, and that should be the motive behind our giving. Father, we thank you that you have been so good to us. You've blessed us, Lord. Blessed us beyond anything we ever dreamed. And Lord, it is our desire to just show you how much we love you and how much we appreciate all that you've done. And Lord, we thank you that we can give our hearts, our lives to you to serve you in response, Lord, to what you've given for us and to us. Bless, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? Now there's two sides to the giving. One is the giving and the other is receiving. Thanks be unto God for his indescribable gift of Jesus Christ. But have you received Jesus Christ? Thank God for his indescribable gift of salvation. But have you received salvation? Thank God for the glorious gift of eternal life. But have you received the gift of eternal life? Though God has given us these indescribable gifts, they're of no value to you whatsoever until you receive them for yourself. And so I encourage you, if you haven't already received the gift of salvation, that you do so. If you haven't received the glorious gift of Jesus Christ, that you do so. If you haven't received the gift of eternal life, that you do so. And what better time than today? I'd encourage you to go back to the prayer room and there just respond to God's love and God's gifts to you. And give him your heart and your life to serve him and to follow him.